Welcome back everyone, this is the second tutorial of the real-time ray tracing tutorial series. I put a link in the description that will bring you to this page where you can download the code where we left off last time. Now, in this tutorial we'll go as far as the sneak peek I gave you last time, and a little bit beyond that actually. Now, let's start with the movement. For the movement I added some variables in the header file which we can use uh, for the rotation of the camera and the position of the camera. Now, in the CPP file, I added um, some functionality to uh, get input from the user. So we can rotate with the WSASD keys and move around with our arrow keys. Now, as you can see, I'm calculating the rotation here and I'm applying that to our movements. And this will make it so that our movement will be always relative to our orientation, which is pretty nice because then left will always be left and forward always be forward. Now, when I'm composing the frame, I make sure that I assign the camera position, I recalculate the rotation to apply that to our viewing direction, and I also apply the rotation to our offset points. Now, I'll do this because when rotating the camera, it is obvious that you have to rotate the viewing direction. But what's not that obvious is that you also need to rotate the screen offset points. Now, um, if you do not rotate the screen offset points and you start rotating around, you see that the orientation of the screen is incorrect. Now, every ray you will generate from this will also be incorrect. Now, a simple fix for this is just rotating the screen offset points as well. And then you basically get camera moving working in a ray tracer. Now we should have something like this, where you can rotate around and move around with a camera. Now this scene is not the best scene to show off camera movements, so I've prepared a new scene for you. And this is a new scene. Uh, it's basically a room with a lot of colorful walls and two spheres inside. And this will be the room we'll be using for a while. So the first thing I did to create the, uh, the room uh, was creating a floating point color class. It's basically identical to the uh, color class, but instead of using an integer to store the color, it uses four floats to store the color, one for every channel. And I swapped two floating point colors because that makes a lot of the lighting calculations a lot easier. Next thing that I did was uh, adding the floating point color to the sphere. Now every sphere stores its own floating point color. To create a room, I added a vector of spheres, game header, and on in it, I create all the spheres. Now, as you can see, there are a lot more spheres than the, the only than the two you saw, and that's because every single wall is a sphere as well. Uh, I did it this way because um, I thought it would be pointless to go through the infinite plane intersection test, as we can do the same with spheres. And that's why the room, the scene, is completely made up of spheres. Uh, I also made sure that uh, we intersect all the spheres, otherwise you wouldn't be able to see them. The next thing that we're going to do is adding point lights to the ray tracer. A point light only needs a position and a color. Next we need to make sure that we take the light into account when coloring the pixel. Here I place the light into the scene. And then whenever I intersect a sphere, I store the hit index. So I can use that later on to calculate the normal of our hit point. And that normal will be used by the diffuse light model, which is basically the normal dotted with the light ray direction, which is obtained by subtracting the hit point from the light's position and normalizing that vector. Uh, what this dot product returns is basically the strength of the uh, light on that surface. And as it's a dot product, it could return a negative number. Now, uh, whenever it's negative, uh, that will mean that the light is behind the normal surface. And in that case, it should not be able to lit the surface, so we just clamp it to zero in that case. Then when, when we're done with that, we multiply the light strength with the, uh, the color of the light and mix that with the sphere's color. And that will result in this correctly lit scene that contains one light. And whenever we uh, move back um, behind a sphere, we can see that's completely black as no light is basically uh, hitting that surface. 
Okay, so next will be the shadows. Now, shadows are uh, really simple in a ray tracer. You just cast some more rays and do some more intersections. I'll explain that in a Unity scene. So now we're at this scene again. I modified it a little bit. I added another sphere and a point light so you can see the shadow on the other sphere. That the one sphere is casting on the other sphere. And I added a vector that goes from our point light towards our hit point. And basically the idea of shadows in a ray tracer is the moment you hit something, let's see if I can time it correctly. Yeah. The moment you hit an object, some geometry, you're gonna try to send a vector that goes from the light towards that hit point. Then you're gonna do an intersection test with all geometry in the scene. If another geometry is in between um, the hit point and the light, uh, then it means that the light will not be able to uh, shine on that object, so um, the light will not be applied. Now in another case, for example this case, you can see that nothing is blocking um, nothing is blocking the light, so obviously we will apply light to this part. And if we do it this way, we have correctly calculated shadows. Let me jump forward to the completed version of this. Now it has finished and you can see that there is a difference, a big difference between the Unity scene and the rendered version. And that's because the rendered version does not have any other light than the point light. So basically everything that's inside the shadow will be completely black as no light will reach it. And that's basically what this code does. And this is the result of the shadows. Now you can already see that our FPS is uh, dropping. But perfect hard shadows are rendered right now. Okay, so our last thing will be adding multiple lights now. Just create a vector that contains lights. And um, we initialize them, give them a position and a color. And we make sure that we loop through every light and basically check if... Um, basically, yeah, we loop through every light. We uh, calculate one final color. Because um, lights basically work additive, so um, we can calculate the effect of the li of one light and then just add it to the last, uh, yeah, basically to the other light, and that will give us the correct color. We do have to uh, take one thing into consideration, and that's uh, when our floating point values go above one. Because if we convert it back to the um, integer integer representations of the color, um, we might overflow the uh, the character value values, and then our basically the colors will be messed up. So we make sure that our um, final color values are between zero and one, and that's uh, done by clamping it. Now we put the final pixel color on the screen, and then our final result will look like this. We have two lights and two spheres and you can see that multiple shadows are uh, created and there are still some black areas and that's just because both uh, the lights do not reach that area. Now you can see that there's some considerable lag, we're probably at 10 FPS right now but yeah that's that's basically what you get with ray tracing and we'll, we'll be doing something about that later on in the series. And that's it for the tutorial. Now, if you want to get notified for when the next tutorial will be released, then don't forget to subscribe.